everyone and welcome back to the final session of PC301 workshop. Thanks to everyone for staying around and uh, we start with the last talk. Uh, once again, we have with us uh, Prof. Kumar Tale from CISPA Helmholtz Center for Information Security and we will be giving the second talk on contraction algorithms. So thank you for joining us, Pratik. Over to you now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, so let's resume uh, i hope the, no, like the first two parts are somewhat or i'll be i was able to convey the message that edge contraction problems are harder than other modification problems and let's with that in mind let's continue with our third part which would be kernelization so in this part we'll see the known results about this edge contraction problems regarding kernel and so again uh, the second part would be a lossy kernel for click contraction and then i'll conclude with some open question in this part and in the fourth part we'll look at the exact algorithms regarding edge contraction uh, as again just to note that this lossy kernel for click contraction you can think of it as a continuation of what msr was doing I'm sure he had established a lossy kernel for few problems and we'll do the same with this so i'll quickly revise the terminology but this in itself should be self-contained okay so uh this is where we left in the last uh, talk like this is a picture we had uh, we see that although the generic techniques to obtain fpt algorithms doesn't work but we do have some handful of problems for which we know that there is an fpt algorithm now uh now that we are looking at a kernelization, let's look at the let's take a closer look at this set of all the problems which admits FPT algorithms, right? And at present, the picture looks something like this. We know that there is a polynomial kernel for path contraction, grid contraction, and when the graph, when the target graph has maximum degree at most two. Uh, we know for the fact that click contraction, tree contraction, cactus contraction, and max degree at most D contraction does not admit a polynomial kernel unless NP is contained into coin P slash poly. And of course, for the three problems that are on the borderline, the status is not known. So maybe this section we can already start with a problem. And uh, so the question is, do we have a polynomial kernel for planar contraction or bipartite contraction? I mean, of course, the question stand for the third problem on the border here also, but I feel, I feel the planar and bipartite contraction are more natural graph classes to first try for, right? Okay, so with this, let's start looking at uh, the first paper, uh, again, uh, Pinar Higgernes et al. in 2011, where they prove that the path contraction admits a polynomial kernel, but tree contraction does not admit a polynomial kernel. And it is a natural question, it's, uh, it is natural to ask why does this happen? Why why is this gap, right? And ca can we interpolate between uh, these two extremes? And with this aim in mind, we can define uh, this class of uh, trees, which we call as a bounded trees, right? So these are defined with respect to some parameter, say L in this case, and this is a subset of trees, right? And these are all the subtrees that have at most L leaves, all right? So with this notation, collection of paths, it's bounded tree, uh, the set of bounded tree whose leaves, number of leaves, it's two, whereas the collection of stars are bounded tree whose uh, number of leaves is almost n minus one. So consider any tree that can be placed into one of these bounded tree uh, graph classes. And but it just gives us a finer view to look at uh, these graph classes or the subclasses of trees. Okay, so uh, this. Okay, yeah. Uh, in 2017, uh, we were able to prove that the bounded tree contraction admits a kernel of size k square plus kl, right? So if you look at these results, this explains both the extremities. Like if you put l is equal to two, we have a kernel of size k square for path contraction. Whereas for star contraction, we can see that since l is not bounded by k, uh, we do not have a we do not have a polynomial kernel even for star contraction and which holds true if you look at the no polynomial kernel reduction for tree contraction that reduction works even for a star contraction right so uh, 
we could interpolate between these two extremes uh, in the kernel. Right. In the same work, what we were managed to show is that the bounded tree contraction does not admit a kernel of sides anything better than what uh, even slightly better than what we have uh, stated unless NP is contained into coNP slash poly. Now, uh, I do not want to say that this is the matching lower bound because uh, what can happen is like the dependency on K and L can vary to give some other kinds of uh, a lower bounds for this problem. It's again, the lower bounds with two variables are slightly tricky. So, but what we can say is that we cannot have a kernel of this size as mentioned in the second theorem. Right. We were able to prove the similar result for bounded cactus contraction and bounded out tree contraction. I'll quickly uh, mention what these graph classes are. So uh, this is again a definition of cactus and what we which we can look at is like in every edge is a part of at most one cycle. Now in this case we look at a bounded, uh, we look at a cactus contraction and we look at its uh, block decomposition. There is a a nice correspondence to its block decomposition and we look at the number of leaves in this block decomposition of cactus in at hand right and we bound the number of edges uh, bound the number of leaves there to bound the number of leaves in a cactus right uh, and when it comes to out tree uh, out tree is a graph in which the underlying uh, undirected graph is a tree and in this every uh, the root has an out degree one and every uh, every edge it's directed away from the root so this is an out tree and even uh, an edge contraction problem in this directed setting also turns out to be hard even this for this well structured graph but as we can see that there is a polynomial kernel when we parameterize by k and the number of leaves in this thing right so uh, this is what we had when it comes to polynomial kernel for uh, for graph contraction problem. Again, this uh, I would say that this list is almost exhaustive or to the best of my knowledge, this list is exhaustive, which uh, we can start with the path contraction problem, uh, which was results from 2011. Then we proved that the bounded tree or cactus admits a polynomial kernel. Uh, it was known that uh, since 2013, a Belmont ATL proved that maximum degree at most two graph contraction problem admits a polynomial kernel. So again, if our target graph class is a collection of cycles and paths, then the problem admits a polynomial kernel. And uh, this year we were able to prove that if the collection is grid, if the target graph class is a set of grids, then the problem admits a polynomial kernel, right? Um, so again, if uh, this seems to be an exhaustive list. So, somehow polynomial kernel doesn't go very well with the edge contraction problems uh, or to the best of my knowledge right so if we look at these graph classes of course all of those have a polynomial kernel but apart from grid all these graph classes has a bounded path width and in fact at some point we were uh, thinking whether it, there would be some dichotomy research which says that only these kind of graph classes has a polynomial kernel but anything outside this may not have a polynomial kernel but so that's why the polynomial kernel for grid seems to be a surprising result at least for me All right so with this uh, limited list of calgy contraction problems for which they admits a polynomial kernel i want to mention this as a problem is there any other graph class calgy such that calgy admits a polynomial kernel and some width parameter for calgy is unbounded All right so here is again if you look at the grid we do not have any restriction on the final size of the grid hence it can have an arbitrarily large path width or tree width All right okay but so this is a small world of uh, edge contraction problem which do admits a polynomial kernel what about no polynomial kernel so uh, again as we mentioned before Hegel's etl proved that tree contraction does not admit a polynomial uh, kernel unless np is contained in co np slash poly uh, similar results were known for click contraction since 2015 right uh, we in 2016 we were able to uh, lift this uh, reduction and prove the similar result for cactus contraction right and in 20 uh, and, and this year we will 
we were managed to show that the maximum de if the target graph class is a set of graph with bounded uh, max degree and our parameter is k plus d then this problem does not admit a, a polynomial kernel when parameterized by both k plus d okay sorry okay so again coming back to this picture we have a uh, this is what we know about this thing right but as we have as you have seen in the last two lectures uh, okay J just to present our results let's add the set of w and hard problem also and let's add a split contraction here and as you have seen in the last two talks by ms or two talks by msr like can we uh, it is natural to ask like does there exist a lossy kernel of polynomial size for edge contraction problem and the answer is yes. In fact, we can uh, we can compute a lossy kernel for click contraction, tree contraction, and cactus contraction, right? So with a small loss in accuracy, we can bound the com our instance by polynomial in K. So for split contraction, uh, this diagram is slightly uh, misleading because uh, the results. I mean, this diagram doesn't do justice to the results regarding split contraction, but you can say that for uh, for alpha greater than two, it does admit a, a lossy kernel. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So this is the state uh, that we had. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, all right. So just to put uh, this thing in perspective, in 2016, uh, we were able to prove that tree contraction and cactus contraction doesn't, uh, uh, sorry, admits a lossy kernel of polynomial sites. While this year, we were able to prove that click contraction and split contraction admits a lossy kernel of polynomial sites. And again, as the only remaining problem in our list for which we definitely know that it doesn't admit a polynomial kernel, uh, I'd like to state this as an open problem, whether maximum degree at most t when parameterized by k plus d admits a lossy kernel or not. Right. Okay. So uh, again, I'm sure uh, this is just a one slide free pressure of what lossy kernels are. I'll just present a working definition. It's like for any alpha strictly greater than one, an alpha lossy kernel for optimization was like we find an alpha lossy kernel for optimization version of the problem, right? And as you re can recall, it's uh, it's basically a set of two polynomial time algorithm. One is called reduction algorithm, which takes an input g comma k and produces an output g prime comma k prime. And in this algorithm, we, don't, we have no restriction on what kind of g prime comma k prime that we need, right? The restriction comes in the solution lifting algorithm, right? Which says that if you, if we are given a C factor solution S prime for our reduced instance, G prime comma K prime, then we should be able to produce alpha into C factor solution for S, uh, uh, alpha into C factor solution S for G comma K, right? So this is the setting that we will be working in our uh, lossy kernelization. Okay, and uh, as a side note, it is allowed to fail if S prime is really bad. Okay, so with this refresher about lossy kernel, let's is there yeah, let's look at the is there a okay, so with this refresher, let's look at the lossy kernel for click contraction, right? So again, um, I'll state the optimization version of the problem, which is different than the previous uh, versions that we were able uh, we were seeing it till this point. So input remains the same. It is a graph G and an integer K, right? Our parameter is K and our objective is to output a set F of edges of minimum cardinality such that G contracted F is a click, right? Now, uh, what we can, uh, so the parameter, the vital role it plays is to say that it dictates that any solution which is larger than k is equally bad. So if we, during our process, if we some can somehow conclude that any solution would be of size strictly greater than k, we can just return any solution. We can just return a spanning tree for that matter, right? So another assumption that we will be working is like g is connected and it has at least k plus three vertices, right? Because I mean, these are of these are obviously safe thing to assume because if g is not connected, no matter what we do, we will not be able to get it 
to a click, right? Also, if it has at most k plus three vertices, then it's a very small instance. We can just return the same as our kernel, right? Okay, so with these two assumptions, we can justify that any spanning tree is a trivial solution, right? So as I said before, if in, we were somehow able to conclude that then any solution is of size at least k, then we just return any spanning tree as it's a trivial solution. Okay, now this is an observation which we have seen over and over again during FPT uh, algorithms. It comes to play here also. And what it says is that if G can be converted into a click by KH contraction, then it can also be converted into a click by 2K vertex deletion. Again, just delete the endpoints of the edges of edges which we would be contracting otherwise. Right. So this gives us our first reduction rule. It says that we are given a graph G comma K, right? We can find a minimum set X such that G minus X is a click, right? Now, uh, see the size of optimum set set is guaranteed to be at most 2K, right? So if we will use some two factor approximation algorithm, uh, which we'll see in a minute, it says that if X is strictly greater than 4K, then we can return a no instance, right? And we can find such such we can find such set X by using a two-factor approximation algorithm for vertex cover in a complement graph. Notice that G minus X is a click. So in a complement graph, G minus X would be an independent set, right? So this is about a reduction rule uh, one, right? In a normal setting, it would have been sufficient to just present this reduction rule. But now that we are dealing with a lossy kernel, I should also specify a solution lifting algorithm that specify uh, that accompanies this first reduction rule. And the solution lifting algorithm works like this, right? If, if our reduction does not change an instance, you just return the same solution, right? And if no, if reduction rule one determines that our instance is a no instance, then we can return any spanning tree, okay? It's again, uh, looks very obvious things to mention, but uh, as I said, uh, without mentioning the solution lifting algorithm, our, redu uh, our reduction will not, reduction rule will not be complete, right? And it's easy to see that reduction rule one is one safe. Okay, right. So before going to the next reduction rule, let's look at a click contraction problem. It's again, as we have seen uh, a couple of times that we can take a click or a Cal G contraction problem and think of it as a partition of V of G. So in this case, what we want is, can, is there a partition of V of G such that each part, which we call a witness set is connected and any two witness sets are adjacent with each other. So it's again, the first property is consistent, no matter which contraction we are talking about. It just depending on a target graph class, we vary the second property. Okay, now that we have applied this uh, first reduction rule, we know that there exists a partition of G, of V of G, such that X is a small set, right? And Y induces a click. In fact, uh, I shouldn't be even be talking about existence. We have this partition at our hand. So we can use this partition to design a reduction rules in our setting. Right, okay. So let's look at these parts, X and Y, and of course, X is bounded by at most 2K. So the no polykernel part of click contraction comes from this Y part. So we have to look at this Y and see what are, what is the role that the vertices in Y are playing? Do we really need to keep all of those with us, right? So let's classify the role of vertices in set Y, right? They can be used to provide connectivity to some witness sets intersecting X. Like in this case, the green, edges, I mean, you can think of green lines as an edges. So X1 or X2 are connected by some vertices in Y, right? And it might be critical for this connection because there may not be another vertex Y which has the same adjacency as this person, uh, as this vertex, right? Or what, it, what a vertex in Y can do, it can dictate a witness set. So for example, look at this exam, uh, look at this X3, X4 and Y2. So let's say that there is no edge between X4 and Y2, but in final click contraction, we know that each witness sets needs to be adjacent with something 
us, every other witness said. So what this role of Y2 is, it says that X4 needs to be contracted to some vertex which is adjacent to Y2. So when I say dictate the witnesses, this is what I mean. Because of this uh, Y2 is present there, certain edge contraction within X should happen. Right. So again, now that we have uh, identified the role of vertices in Y, we can look at what are the, what uh, can we do some marking and store some limited number of vertices instead of storing the entire Y. Okay. So the first thing is for every subset X prime of X, we can mark a vertex, which is its common neighbor, right? And to, to simulate uh, the roles of Y. And for the second part, for every subset X prime of X, we can mark at least two K plus one vertices, which are non-common neighbors, right? So for example, since we have marked two K plus one vertices and we are contracting at most K edges, to get it to a click, at least one of this vertex will not have an any edge incident on this. So that vertex will remain an independent and that will still dictate uh, the uh, witness sets in X, right? But this is too much of a marking. In fact, this is a, uh, what I'm presenting here would be a kernel for click contraction of size two power k, because if you do this for every subset of x prime, you are marking some poly k many vertices for two power k many order k many sets, right? And of course, we cannot offer that. But what we can do instead of every subset of x prime, we mark we do this marking of for every subset x prime of x, which is of size at most t, right? So our first marking criteria is for every subset x prime of x of size at most t mark a vertex, which is a common neighbor, all right? And our second marking scheme will be for every subset X prime of X, which is of size at most D, mark two K plus one vertices, which are not a common neighbor. Okay, and let's see whether we can achieve what we want to achieve with this level of marking. Again, uh, our D depends on alpha, right? As you can see on the upper right corner, this is the relation that we have with D and alpha. and uh, as expected, D is inversely proportional to alpha. So if you reduce the num uh, margin of error that one is allowed to make, you have to mark more and more vertices. Okay. Right. And this would be our reduction rule. Mark the vertices in Y using these two procedures and delete all the unmarked vertices. So again, it's slightly tricky to see that uh, now that we are running over all the vertices of size K of size at most D, the total number of vertices are in the tune of K power D, right? But again, since alpha is constant and D is constant, and if the input is really large, this reduction rule will work in a, will run in a time which is polynomial in the size of input. Okay, right. Let's see what we can achieve with this uh, reduction rules. So let Y prime be the deleted vertices right and g minus y prime comma k is a reduced instance right so suppose someone comes and gives us a solution f prime for this reduced instance right what we can and when we try to patch or uh, obtain a solution for okay so f prime is a solution for reduced instance so it doesn't have any y prime or uh, vertex in it or there is no edge incident on y prime which is incident on it right what happened if we try to bring y prime and attach it to the contracted vertices already, uh, to the graph which has been contracted already, right? So there might be some bad vertex in Y prime, right? See, notice that we are already given that G minus Y prime, in that if I contract F prime many edges, we already get a click. So this X union Y minus Y prime, we know how to make a click out of it because F prime is given to us. Now the set of Y prime vertices just comes and we see that Oh, look at these blue guys, which are contracted into each other because of F prime. None of the vertices in W is adjacent with Y prime. So what we got after adding Y prime is not a click and because of this reason, right? So uh, again, the notion of bad vertices in Y prime is they are not adjacent with some witness set W, which is entirely in X. Notice that if the witness set intersect Y, right? because y was a 
click initially, this vertex in Y prime would be adjacent to that witness set. So in this case, we only need to worry about witness sets that are contained entirely in X, right? Now, what we can argue that W has a size at least D plus one, right? Okay, if not, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. Yeah, what we can conclude is like W has a size at least D plus one, right? So if not, uh, if not, we would have marked some vertices from W and this situation would not have happened. We'll come to that in a minute. But looking at this, we can develop our solution lifting algorithm, right? In this case, what we can do is add a vertex in Y minus Y prime to such witness set, right? Now notice that W has sides at least D plus one and I'm just adding one, I'm just contracting one more edge. And so this is the, this is the error that we would be introducing. So at some point we will have to count and bound this error that we are introducing, right? Okay, if we do this, then what happens to the solution size obtained uh, using this process? So we have F prime with us, Y prime comes and we find some bad vertex in Y prime. In that case, we look at the witness at W, we will argue that it has a size at least D plus one, right? And we are adding an extra edge for this W. And notice that adding one vertex to W from Y minus Y prime suffices, right? Now there is no bad vertex with respect to W because you have this purple, the endpoint of this purple edge, which was in Y was adjacent to every vertex in Y prime. So for every such W, all we need is one extra contraction, right? So if we keep doing this, the size of solution F for G we will get is of size D plus one over D times cardinality of F prime. Again, we are just spending one extra for the D uh, solution edges, which were already in W. Okay. So that's one part of the proof. What we can say is like, we are, we started with G comma K, we reduced it to G prime comma K prime, right? And we have obtained that given a C factor solution solution lifting algorithm can construct an alpha C factor solution for G comma K, right? So this is one part, but what we also have to argue that the reduction algorithm does not destroy the optimum solution, right? Because if you look at it, we are given a graph G, which uh, suppose we're able to uh, convert it, we were able to convert it to a click using at most K contraction, right? Now what happens is, you are deleting certain vertices. Now there is a risk that we run into the case that the vertices that we were deleting were providing very good connectivity or the connectivity that we needed. Now that we have got rid of those, the connectivity, it might still be able to contract it to a click, but we need much more uh, edges than what we used to. Right? So we have to carefully argue that the opt of G prime comma K, it's strictly less than opt of G comma K. Okay, so let's see what, uh, how to argue that. So suppose this is the structure that we have, right? And consider a solution uh, for G comma K, right? Now the solution could be of type Y. I mean, so by solution, I mean a witness set. Now it could happen that we contracted an edge which was completely in Y prime, right? But this may not be an issue in G prime because we have completely deleted uh, y prime vertices. So we can just forget about this edge, right? There could be a, uh, the second type of solution edges could be that something uh, is in y prime, uh, an edge which is in y prime and y, but not in x. Uh, there is something in the chat. No, no, it was just a network issue on my end. Sorry, please continue. Ah, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, so uh, where was I? Yeah, look at the type, uh, edges of a solution, which is of type two, like a one endpoint in Y prime and another endpoint in Y, right? But it's not in X. Now, what could happen because of this second endpoint, which is in Y prime, which will be deleted, the witness set got certain sets of adjacency. This blue witness set got certain sets of adjacency too. But uh, we can argue that since we have done enough marking, even in this case, we will always be able to find another vertex to replace this vertex in Y prime, right? The trickier case would be a uh, type three in which we have a one edge, an edge, 
of whose one endpoint is in y prime and another endpoint in x right so in this case again we argue that since we have done enough marking we can always find a purple edge which we can replace with the green edge which is present in the solution right okay so with these three types of case analysis we can argue that it does not destroy the optimum uh, it does not destroy the optimum uh, optimum of the instance or the number of edges that we needed to contract g to a click is is an upper bound for the number of edges that we need to contact g prime into a click which again basically the second lemma which i wanted to explain right okay so with these two lemma in hand we know that our reduction rule 2 is alpha safe right because if we are given an alpha uh, f prime right uh, we know that if it is c factor solution because of our construction of cal uh, f we know that it is alpha times c factor solution for the original instance okay right so let's look at both of these reduction rules what we can see is that first reduction rule ensures that the cardinality of x is at most 4k right whereas the second reduction rule marks some vertices and deletes the rest right so because of this marking at for every set of size at most d we have marked some polynom poly k many vertices right so we know that y minus y prime is of size k power d right and putting these things together what we can get is like for any alpha which is strictly greater than one click contraction parameterized by the size of solution k admits an alpha lossy kernel with order k over d vertices here d is inversely proportional to alpha right and which as i mentioned is expected because the less margin you allow for the error higher larger will be the size of kernel right okay yeah so in the similar uh, in the same project we were able to establish this result for split contraction which which it says that for any alpha strictly greater than 2 split contraction parameterized by the size of solution admits an alpha lossy kernel with order k power f of d vertices here again uh, d is inversely proportional to alpha as expected and f of d is a quadratic function in d right uh, as i have highlighted uh, this reduction works for alpha strictly greater than 2 right so the obvious question is can we improve it for any alpha which is strictly greater than 1 right and the answer is no i mean this is not just we couldn't analyze it there is a lower bound which says that you cannot have a such result for any alpha which is strictly greater than one and now that i have some 24 minutes i think i don't need to skip so i'll just uh, i'll present another reduction which gives an overview of how to prove such lower bounds how to prove that such result cannot exist right okay so uh, Again, assuming there is an alpha kernel of alpha lossy kernel of size f of k, where alpha is some value between one and two, right? We can start with g comma k, which was our input instance, right? We can reduce it to g prime comma k prime, right? Because of our reduction rule, right? And any solution for f prime will return a solution f for original instance, right? And we have a guarantee now that we have this assumption that there exists an alpha lossy kernel that if f prime is a c factor solution right then f is alpha into c factor alpha into c factor solution right so what we can do is like we can s compute an optimum solution for g prime comma k prime again note that since it's a alpha lossy kernel of size f of k we can afford this running time we can afford a brute force on g prime comma k prime right now since it's an optimum solution we can come we have c is equal to one so we get an f prime which is an optimum in other words c is equal to one right and with this we can compute an alpha factor solution for g comma k in fpt time right so an alpha, alpha factor fpt approximation for split contraction i mean this oh oh sorry what I mean is like this might give us an alpha factor FPT approximation for split contraction if we have this setting, right? But if there is a problem, 
right, which does not admit an alpha factor FPT approximation algorithm. And we can produce a gap preserving reduction from that problem to split contraction. Then we can rule out that there is no alpha lossy kernel of this size for split contraction. Right? Again, right now we are considering the values of alpha, which are between one and two. Right? And for those kind of uh, for alpha in that range, we need to argue that there exists no alpha lossy kernel of any size. Okay. All right. So let's start with such problem as like uh, 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 the problem that satisfy those property or one of the problems that satisfy those property would be a densest case subgraph. So what would be an input to this uh, densest case subgraph? You can think of uh, it's a graph G integer K and a T and a constant epsilon and beta. Where epsilon is strictly smaller than one and beta is strictly greater than one. Our parameters are K plus T, right? And our uh, output, uh, our objective is to output, are there at least beta K vertices that span at epsilon T many edges? Right? And we are given a guarantee that there is a click of sites K in G. Right. So one way to relate to this problem, it start from a, a click or a K click problem. Now, there in this setting, the K would be K is K, T is K choose two. And what we are asking is, are there K vertices which span at least K choose two edges or exactly K choose two edges, right? So this is a, a bit more generalization of uh, K click uh, problems, right? Now, what we have is, are there, uh, we, it comes with a guarantee. This problem instance can come with a guarantee says that there is a click of size K in G. With this guarantee, can we output such vertices and edges? And in Fox 2017 uh, paper, these people proved that assuming gap ETH, densest K subgraph cannot be solved in time F of K comma T poly N for any function of F. All right. So we have a problem for which we know uh, it cannot be approximated in f of k com f of k time. All we need to do is present a gap preserving reduction from this problem to split contraction. Okay, yeah. So this would be our objective. What we also need to consider is that this reduction should run in FPT time. Right. And G prime can be contracted to a split graph with k prime many edge contraction. Right. Now uh, this is an existing, this is a guarantee for the existence of optimum solution. And we will use this to present an, to, uh, to present a solution, which is certain sides away from optimum solution. But just because of this guarantee, we know that the optimum solution of split contraction, right? And we can prove that for alpha, which is very close to one, in fact, which is smaller than 1.25, given an alpha factor solution for split contraction, we can obtain a solution for densest K subgraph in polynomial time, right? So with this setting, we can, re uh, we can refute an existence of alpha lossy kernel for smaller values of alpha, because again, this theorem says that such, such a function cannot exist, right? So it's again, uh, this would be a high level idea for the proof uh, for the reduction from densest K subgraph to colorful uh, a dense uh, K subgraph, right? So what we can do is we can start with a partition of E of G into T parts, mainly, uh, namely E1 to E2, right? And select, we can select one edge from each part. So now we have even, we have imposed even more structure on this thing. We, n we not only want T edges that needs to be spanned by K vertices, we want that we can select exactly one edge from each part. And this reduction is again, a, a standard a, a trick of using perfect hash family to get from this problem to another problem. Again, uh, I just want to highlight the fact that this will take an FPT time in K comma T, but since we can afford FPT time in reduction, we can afford FPT time in this, uh, in this reduction also. Right. Okay. So we start uh, with this. We start with the construction. We say that suppose we have a seed click that will be results in a split graph. So again, uh, 
look at the figure on right hand side and imagine the split graph that would even we will eventually obtain by some edge contraction in that split graph we'll have this z which is a click would be on the click side of the split graph so all we have to do is look at the other vertices merge most of those vertices into this seed click right so that would be our objective of seed click this is already quite a large click which is already there right all we have to do is send some vertices towards that so that the remaining part remains an independent set right okay so in this seed click we can look at uh, okay sorry so uh, i think i forgot to mention uh, now that we have this partition of e of g we can add add a vertex for each edge right in this part so this es1 to est becomes our partition right and edge selector is if we pick a vertex from this to to send it to z then we can consider that edge being selected right in the seed click what we can do is for every vertex u right now note that u represents to uh, uh, for every vertex u we add certain set of vertices right and x u is too large to be removed uh, by k prime so this set of vertices are too big that no amount of edge contraction can push them out of the click right now we add a vertex w which corresponds to edge uv such that w is adjacent to almost every vertex in this seed clicks apart from its end point right so to put it uh, in other way it covers all all other vertices apart from its end point okay so if i were to get this w underscore u comma v to the seed click it is adjacent with every vertex except x u and x v hence i need to contract some other vertices with w u comma v right and finally we have this sv which we call as an enforcer which is there just to say that ah uh, okay we have a click at sv we have a click at z and in a split graph we cannot have these two types of click so we need to send all the vertices in sv via some edge selector finally to z right so this we will call it as an enforcer right again we uh, as a technicality we can have one special vertex in z right and that vertex can only accommodate k many x us right i hope uh, it is clear anyway so uh, with this setup uh, and again i'm sorry for the hand waving but with this setup we can see that the solution for split contraction right is a t edges which will each corresponds to an edge selector in the above set plus the k vertices that we had to contract because the t edges that comes we need to satisfy their adjacency to the vertices corresponds to their corresponding to their end points so we have a very limited budget we had to spend t or a order t budget to bring vertices in sv to z right and once we got this t vertices uh, into z we have only a budget of k to to make sure that z again becomes a click with this added vertices right so this is kind of a correlation between co colorful densest k subgraph and the solution for split contraction right okay again uh, what i tried to convey is like there is an fpt algorithm uh, that takes an colorful instance of densest k subgraph and gives us a split con instance of split contraction right we have some handle on the optimum solution for this split contraction because of the guarantee right and this reduction works only for smaller values of alpha right so putting this together we can say that assuming gap eth no fpt algorithm can approximate split contraction within a factor of alpha for any alpha smaller than 1.25 okay uh sorry for the handwing but uh, i think uh, i have 13 minutes left and i wanted to finish this things okay so i hope uh, the fourth part would be less hand wavy and more uh, more intuitive than the previous one right as promised we will look at two brute force algorithm one for click contraction uh, one for path contraction we'll argue that the algorithm for click contraction is optimal under eth or rather we'll see a result which says that but we'll see that the algorithm for path contraction can be improved right and as uh, 
as in other sections, we'll close with some open problems. Okay. Um, again, to reiterate the definition, we have this edge contraction. It's basically to say that look at a graph, uh, look at V of G, and can we contract V of G into V of H many parts such that each part is connected and each part is mapped to some vertex in H such that V1 and V2, which are the subset of V of G, are adjacent if and only if H1 and H2 are adjacent. Okay, all right. So in this setting, we will be looking at largest Calgi contraction problem. Again, to revisit the definition, here our input is only graph G. And the question is, can we find the largest graph in Calg to which G can be contracted? Right. For example, uh, consider an example of largest click contraction. Here the input is graph G and the objective is find the size of largest click to which G can be contracted. Right. This problem, as I mentioned before, is uh, has been studied in a, a structural graph theory and it's known as a Hadwinger number. Right. Okay. So a G can be contracted to, to a click of size Q if and only if V of G can be partitioned into Q parts such that each part is connected and any two parts are adjacent with each other. Right. Now this gives us a simple brute force algorithm. We can just run over every Q partition of V of G. Right. And if this partition satisfy both A and B, then we return yes, otherwise we return no, right? Okay, now as Q is at most N, because I mean, we can only think of a click, uh, edge contraction will reduce the number of vertices. This algorithm runs in time N power order N, right? So the natural question is, can we solve it any better than N power order N? In this year's ICAL paper, uh, Feder, I, I think I won't be able to, isn't it? Feder and co uh, proved that unless ETH is false, there is no algorithm that can compute an Hadwinger number on N vertex graph in time N power little of N. So they say that, look at this simple brute force algorithm, will not be able to improve on it very significantly and, or at least in the exponent unless ETH fails. Right, and then they presented a robust reduction, which can be utilized, uh, which can be modified to prove the reduction for all these problems. So perfect contraction, caudal contraction, split contraction. And again, uh, this is uh, roughly in the hierarchy of uh, subclasses of the previous graph class. We say that these types, uh, there is no n power little o of n algorithm for these kinds of algorithm, uh, these kind of problems on n vertex graph. Right. Okay. So this is one type of uh, brute force algorithm. But let's look at the graph class where our graphs can be colored with much smaller number of edges. So this would be a typical picture of G, which is can be contracted to edge. But if we consider a case when our edge is a path, which means it can be colored only with two colors. So we can project these colors back to the vertices in G and see what happens there. So instead of running over all the partitions, we can just run over two colorings of G and contract each colored connected components to get to a path, right? So this leads us to another simple algorithm. It says that for every two coloring of V of G, right? Uh, look at a connect, uh, we can contract all the connected color components. And if it results in path, we just return yes. Otherwise we return no. Okay, now this algorithm clearly, run, uh, clearly runs in time to power n poly n, right? Now, so the natural question is, can we break this to power n barrier for longest path contraction problem? Okay, right. So there has been, uh, this has been studied for quite a long and the notable results uh, from 2009 would be this. They had a similar results for other graph classes, but what they study is like, oh, we can beat this two power n barrier for longest path contraction problem, but when input is P6 free graph. 
and as you add more and more conditions to this you get a different running time but this is kind of a representation so so yes we can break this barrier but when the input graph had some restrictions right so this was followed by a uh, work by uh, telian willinger in 2013 which said that okay we can work we can have an algorithm which solves p4 contraction so now you cannot contract it to the largest cycle but now you have a restriction on a target graph class like if it contains only one graph which only one path on four vertices then we are able to break this barrier and uh, last year we were able to break this barrier for uh, which has no restriction either on the input graph or on the size or on the path in the target graph class so we will we were able to prove that there is a 1.9998 power n algorithm which uh, given a graph g on n vertices runs in this time and outputs an integer such that our input graph can be contracted to a path of that length okay so this was the uh, this was what i wanted to mention in the literature part right but these simple algorithms can be generalized to any graph class so for example if every graph in calg can be colored with q colors then there is a simple algorithm that runs in q power n right uh, and we can solve largest calg contraction in this time so the natural question is can we break this barrier right as we have done for path contraction in a more concrete fashion can we have a 1.999 power n algorithm for largest tree contraction or similar types of algorithm for largest bipartite contraction so i'd like to keep these two as an open questions in this domain and uh, yeah i think with this i'd like to conclude this talk uh, thank you and happy new year i think i'm oh, i'm 7 minutes early sorry that's okay yeah <laughs> okay thank you so much for the thanks for the great yeah. talk